Welcome to the new playlist. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. During 6502, the rule book, breadboard build. In theory, this is as simple as computer architecture gets. Modern CPUs and GPUs are ridiculously complicated. They are great for learning how to program, and modern development environments are truly amazing. But if you really want to understand how computers work, it's way too complicated to start here. It would be like deciding you want to learn how to fly an aeroplane and choosing a 747 as your flight trainer. So let's jump right into the 6502 architecture instead. All right, let me see. Hmm. Well, it still looks pretty complicated. There's some buses, a program counter, the A register, the B register, the index X, index Y, instruction register, status register, stack pointer, ALU control unit, getting very complicated again. The 6502 is a von Neumann architecture, and while von Neumann architectures are an efficient way to make microprocessors, they're still very complicated. Isn't there somewhere easier we can start? Introducing Alan Turing, who's considered to be the father of computer science. His work was not known for many years, but now he's probably most famous for his role in cracking the World War II Enigma code. This effort was brilliantly depicted in the imitation game, and if you haven't seen it, this really is a great movie, and you should make an effort to see it. He wrote a pivotal paper in 1936 where he formalised what we often do naturally in mathematics. His paper was titled On Computable Numbers with an Application to the Entscheidungs Problem. My apologies for my pronunciation to any German speakers. Turing solved this issue of the Entscheidungs Problem, and in doing so, he defined a Turing machine and a universal Turing machine, where a universal Turing machine is a Turing machine that can emulate any other Turing machine. So in principle, a universal Turing machine should be able to emulate the 6502 microprocessor. In fact, a universal Turing machine should be able to emulate every other computer, including the largest supercomputers of the modern era. So I want to build a Turing machine that emulates the 6502. And here's how it works. At the lowest level, I'll have some memory chips, such as EEPROMs and static RAMs and some 7400 series logic. From them, I'll build a universal Turing machine and on this universal Turing machine, I'll run a 6502 emulator. And then on top of that, I'll run Apple II Pac-Man. And for this build, I'm going to go back to breadboards. So what's a breadboard? Well, a breadboard's a small piece of plastic with multiple holes, and each hole has a metal clip behind it. And these clips hold onto wires and make electrical contact with them. There are internal wires within the breadboard, which connect the pins in this pattern. The longer horizontal wires are generally used for distributing power, and the vertical wires are used to connect signals to chips. Here are some of the other rules for the breadboard build. I want it to be as simple as possible to make it easy to understand. I want to use 7400 series logic, which will mainly be D-type flip-flops. I can use as much static RAM and EEPROM space as I want. I don't care about clock speed for now, but I do want it to eventually run in real time. And I'll use an Arduino Nano or Dewey for display. And most important of all, I want it to be able to play Apple II Pac-Man. It's hard to overstate how important Turing's paper is, but that said, it's not really an easy read. So instead, I'm going to give you my interpretation. The surprising thing is that you probably already know how a Turing machine works, you just don't know that you know it. To me, a Turing machine is a rule book and a notepad, and a way of remembering which rule you're using and where you are on the notepad. And that's it. What do I mean by a rule book? Well, I'm going to use what's hopefully a very familiar example. Monopoly. In Monopoly, we have a board which has a number of squares on it, and we have a piece which represents us and where we are in the game. In this case, I'll be the ship. We always start at go. Then, when it's my turn, I roll the dice and combine that number with my current location to figure out where to go to next. Most people just count out the changes as they go along. Instead, I'm going to generate a big table which tells us where to go next based on where we currently are and the number we roll on the dice. Why might we do that? Well, the rules are different for being in jail. To get out of jail, you need to roll a six. Otherwise, you stay in jail. And it's important that this rule book covers every possible Monopoly board position and all possible numbers that can be thrown on the dice. So this table always tells us where to go to next. This ship represents me, and at the start of the game, I move to go. When I am in go, these are all the possible rules that could apply to me from here. 
Then, when it's my turn, I roll the dice. A three. Now, I know I'm in the go position, and I rolled a three, so the rulebook tells me I need to move to Whitechapel Road. Then, I move my ship from the go position to the Whitechapel Road position. All right, now I'm in the Whitechapel Road position, and in the real game, I could buy it or I may have to pay rent, which really isn't captured by this set of rules. We're mainly concerned about how to move at this stage. Now, after that, I'm still in the Whitechapel position, but I wait for everyone else to have a turn. When it's my turn again, I roll the dice. A two. So I look up in the rule book what to do if I roll a two while I'm Whitechapel, and it tells me to move to King's Cross Station. And you guessed it, I move to King's Cross Station. Now I'm getting to my point. I haven't done this to make the world's most boring YouTube video ever. As an aside, we can relabel all the board positions, and it doesn't really change the game. Here is the roll dull version of the game, which my daughters prefer. So instead of Pall Mall and Mayfair, we have Grand High Witch and Sophie. Now imagine we renamed all of the Monopoly positions, starting with Q1 and going all the way around to Q40. Labels like Q1 and Q40 are a lot more boring than names like Old Kent Road and Mayfair, but the game's still the same. It turns out we have a lot of intuitive knowledge about Monopoly. We know that a single piece represents you, you always start at go, which is Q1. There are a finite or fixed number of board positions, Q1 through Q40, which is go to Mayfair. Your piece can only be in one place at a time, so it can only be in Q1, Q2, or any other position up to Q40. You can't be in multiple board positions at the same time. And you only get to move when it's your turn. And finally, the current position and the dice roll determines what to do next. So I want you to keep this in mind as we go to Turing's paper. We may compare a man in the process of computing a real number to a machine which is only capable of a finite number of conditions, Q1, Q2 through QR, which will be called M configurations. So what does this mean? What are these M configurations? Well, what we call board positions in Monopoly are what Turing called M configurations. It defines where you are and what rules apply to you. In computer science, we call them states, and we put this special double circle around the starting state. And although I started at Q1 and gone to Q2, Q3, Q4, I could have just as easily called them any, meeny, miny, and mo. And what this means is that while the rulebook with the street names is more human readable, both of these rulebooks contain the same information, and they're actually interchangeable with a small conversion chart. So now I want to build a physical rulebook in my Turing machine. So what we need is a piece of hardware that takes the current board position and the number rolled on the dice, and outputs the next board position. Turing called these inputs the configuration, and the output the behaviour, although these terms aren't really used that commonly anymore. To do this, I'm going to briefly cover computer memory, but I go over it in a lot more detail in the Apple II wire-by-wire -wire build. And so if you're not familiar with ROMs and RAMs, I suggest you have a look at that playlist. So I use a set of pigeonholes with rubber ducks as a metaphor for computer memory. The pigeonholes need to be numbered, and in computer science we start at zero, and the information is actually carried by the colour of the duck. These pigeonholes with rubber ducks are a metaphor for what's going on inside the memory chip itself. Conceptually, here's what happens during a memory read. Now in our case, we don't want to use coloured ducks. We want to use monopoly board positions and the number rolled on a dice. We can program these rules into a device called an erasable programmable read-only memory, or EEPROM. Now let's start building our Turing machine. Rule book. Notepad, but I'll go over the notepad in a lot more detail in the next video. So in addition to the rules themselves, I'm going to need some extra hardware which tells me which board position I'm in, which also tells me which M configuration I'm in, or which state I'm in, depending on whose nomenclature we use. So there is a chip that can store just one number, and it acts a bit like a single pigeonhole. I went over this in a lot more detail in the Apple II wire-by-wire -wire build, but here's a brief summary. The chip stores a piece of information, and new information is presented on the input wires. Then, on the positive edge of the clock signal, 
The value on the input wires gets stored inside the chip and represented on the output wires. And the value on the input wires can change as much as they like, it only really matters what's there on the positive edge of the clock. So in effect, the chip stores what it saw on the positive edge of the clock. Now it can be monopoly board positions, or states, or even ducks, provided the information can be represented by a number. So as part of the rule book structure, we have a way of remembering the current rule. And this white square is a symbol we use to represent D-type flip-flops. And in the Monopoly analogy, this is where we store the location of your piece. In a more pictorial representation, the EEPROM stores all the rules, and the D-type flip-flops store where you are on the board. This is actually the EEPROM build from the first Apple Wire-by-Wire -wire build video. I replaced the Ducks EEPROM with the Monopoly EEPROM, and I put an octal flip-flop on the output. I use the lower right dials to set the current position, and the third dial is to enter the number I rolled on the dice. I roll a 4, I set the dials, position 5 with dice 4, I press the update button which clocks the answer into the flip-flop, and it tells me 9. So this is a demonstration of the Monopoly rulebook. Now in this example, I'm the one that converts the next position into the current position by setting the dials to be in the position indicated by the upper display. Now we need an automatic path to feed the current rule back into the rulebook, and that's what this bus is for. And we also need a path to present the next board position to the flip-flops. So this is what allows us to move from one board position to the next, and this is what occurs on the positive edge of the clock signal. For a more generalizable machine though, we use current and next state rather than current and next board position. We use read symbol rather than the dice. And now we need some extra outputs. A write symbol and a signal to tell us how to update the notepad location. So I'll go over this in a lot more detail in the next video. I'll add these signals into our block diagram. Turing doesn't tell us how many symbols we're allowed to use. So I'm going to allow 8 bits for this. Mainly so that I can match the 8 bits on the 6502. Now I'm planning to use multiple bits to update the notepad location, and this is for speed. But in the strictest definition of a Turing machine, we're only allowed one bit for left or right. And in the pure Turing playlist, I only use one. But I'm getting a bit ahead of my skis now. I'll explain this all later in the playlist. Now this structure I've built actually has a known name in computer science. It's called a finite state machine, or just a state machine. But to build it out of actual parts, I need to be conscious of the data pathways. I'm planning on using two EEPROMs, each 32 megabits in size. They're configured to have a 21-bit address space and a 16-bit data range. By wiring these chips in parallel, I end up with an effective data path of 32 bits. And to capture this 32-bit output, I'm going to need four octal D-type flip-flops. So this is like having a Monopoly game with 8,192 board positions and a 256-sided dice. I don't really like the data pin arrangement on the 27C322, so I'm going to redefine it. And that's okay, provided I make a correction before I burn the data into the EEPROM. The rest of this video is going to be a build. First, I'll connect power up to all the chips. Then I'll connect the data output from the EEPROMs up to the Octal D-type flip-flops. And then I'll connect the output of the D-type flip-flops back to the input of the EEPROMs.
That's the end of the rulebook build for the Turing 6502. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and share.